This is my 167th video on my work with OO Gauge. See part 1 of this series for my reasons for getting into OO Gauge when I already had a lot invested in working in N Gauge and I didn't really have space available for a large fully operational OO Gauge layout. Also see my series on my N Gauge railway modeling for smaller and more complex scenery and smaller scale trains running. This part will continue my progress with my Hornby 00 three rail table top railway, this time bringing another train set to the table top. A heavy freight set with a Stania 8F locomotive. And since the loco with this set comes in BR livery, I'll be rebadging it as an LMS engine. I started my three-rail tabletop railway with the Duchess of Athol train set, an obvious logical starting point for me given my focus on the LMS, the railway that my family worked for. I wasn't really expecting to buy another train set as I wasn't aware of one that would helpfully expand my three-rail railway within my LMS prototype. There was, of course, the EDG-7 tank engine set, which was sold with the Loco in LMS livery, but that Loco model was the Dread N2, loosely modelled on the NER N2 engine. And that really didn't look remotely like anything that was actually run by the LMS, so far as I'm aware. The LMS did inherit a couple of obscure classes of 062 freight tank engine designed early in the 20th century by Longbottom and Adams, but those were so obscure that I haven't been able to find any picture of an example. There was also the LNWR Webb Coal Tank, which was 062, and which has been modelled in OO gauge by Backman, but that doesn't look anything like the Hornby N2 model, the chimney, dome and cab all being much taller. The bottom line, I guess, is that I just can't pass the Hornby 062 tank off to myself as an LMS engine, so I wasn't intending to get one. Useful little models, though they doubtless are. And I wasn't aware of another Hornby 00 train set that would help me along with an LMS tabletop railway. But then one that I wasn't expecting came up on eBay UK. This is the G25 LMR280 freight train set, as Hornby called it. This is a set that was issued fairly late in 003 rail days. I have a 1958 Meccano catalogue for the Canadian market, I'm living in Canada now, and this set is listed in that 1958 catalogue as forthcoming, with no definite price yet set. The set was of considerable interest to me, as it featured a three rail double O model of the Stania 8F. I have double O two rail and Wren examples of the 8F, but until I came across the listing for this train set, I wasn't aware that Hornby had released the 8F in a three rail version. This set was offered for sale as seen here. With its original rolling stock and track, it apparently didn't come with a controller, and some extra items. I believe three more wagons than were included in the original set, and also one buffer stop and a water crane and a distant signal. It was offered for £115 plus postage. The postage to Canada for a large item such as this was quite high, and I also had to pay import duty. Still, I had no real hesitation on clicking buy it now for this item, as for about $290 Canadian altogether, I was getting a 3-rail 8F in apparently good condition, plus 8 wagons, some track and other odds and ends. The 8F model was in British Railways livery. Hornby seemed to have very much concentrated on British railways in the 1950s. I assume that they felt that most interest in the market that they were serving would be in modelling Britain's railways as they existed at the time, rather than historically. Still, the 8F is, of course, very much a classic LMS locomotive, designed by William Stanier in 1935 as a heavy freight version of his successful Black 5 design. The wagons that came with the set to me were a bit of a mixed bag, leaning towards representing BR usage at the time of the set's release. The metal shell tank wagon actually goes well back, both as a Hornby model and in real use. 
The open wagon at centre-left has a very strange load. It appears that someone has taken two loads, presumably from their size, meant for Triang TT wagons, and randomly glued those loads into this OO gauge wagon. I'm not sure what they felt this was representing, and I expect I'll remove those loads, but they're glued firmly in place. The white vent van won't look too odd in an LMS train. The press flow wagon probably represents a design too late for my prototype. I'll have to investigate. The metal SO wagon is again a fairly old design. The Welltroll bogey wagon is not exactly appropriate to my period, but the LMS did run bogey well wagons from basically pretty much the start of the LMS. That buffer stop is the first double-O buffer stop that I've received. I have an order coming with several more, and I will need four or more for my track plan. And I'm sure I can find a place for the water crane on my tabletop. Finally, with respect to rolling stock, the set came with another open wagon and a brake van. Regrettably, from my point of view, the brake van is of the GWR towed type, so it won't really fit with my LMS trains and I will pass it on to someone else, I expect. I'm not sure about the distance signal. I suppose I can put it somewhere. Distant signals don't really work very logically on tabletop-sized layouts, as by scale in OO, there should be something like 17 feet of track between a distance signal and the home signal to which it is related. The set came with the standard pieces for an oval of track, more or less, eight standard curves to make a circle, and then straights to make two sides, a single full straight in length. In this case, rather than two actual full straights, there was one full straight and then two half straights, one of them having the pieces beside the centre rail, presumably intended to go at a level crossing. Unlike my Duchess of Athol set, which came with a straight power feed track, this set came with the power feed track as one of the standard curves. This will be useful to me as it gives me the option of having my power feed on a corner curve rather than in the front straight. Here's the end of the box lid from the set showing the product information. If you know more about this set, please let me know in the comments below. It was obviously released in the late 1950s and doesn't seem to be very commonly found, so perhaps it didn't sell in great numbers? When I looked more closely at the Loco model, seeing no centre pickups on the Loco, my first reaction was, oh no, this is a two-rail 8F after all. That would have been a bit of a disaster, as the whole reason that I bought this set was to get a three-rail 8F, and I already had a couple of two-rail 8Fs, so I really didn't need another one. But as the more knowledgeable amongst my viewers may have already guessed, my concern there was misplaced. There are no centre rail pickups on the Loco, because in the case of this model, the centre rail pickups are on the tender. The tender has plunger-style pickups for the centre rail, and a wire connects the tender and Loco to pass power from those tender pickups to the motor in the Loco. I hadn't seen plunger pickups like that before, except on the original Rovex Princess Royal, which had plunger pickups on the loco, one for each rail for two rail operation. Hopefully these will work better than the Rovex two rail plunger pickups, which were notoriously unreliable. In this case, there are two pickups for the centre rail spaced a good distance apart, so hopefully they won't have difficulty maintaining power continuity. Apparently Hornby used this pickup system for a number of three-rail models, but I'm still quite new to three-rail and I hadn't encountered it before. I took the Loco model to the bench to check its functioning, and again I had something of an oh-no reaction, as the Loco wouldn't run when I applied power to the plunger pickups on the tender and the Loco wheels. Given that the model wouldn't initially run, I figured I'd better disassemble it to access the motor directly. I looked at the loco to tender connection. It appeared that someone had lost the screw for attaching the drawbar to the loco and had replaced it with a somewhat bodged solution. The screw at the loco end of the drawbar, well, I guess bolt technically, fitted okay so far as the thread was concerned, but it wasn't shouldered, as the pivot screw should be, and its head was really too small, so a washer had been inserted to assist with grip and pivoting. I disconnected the drawbar, and then looked at the bottom of the loco for a screw to allow me to remove the body, but I didn't find one. 
Then I noticed that there appeared to be a tong on the back of the chassis fitted into a slot on the back of the body, so presumably it should be possible to detach the body from the chassis at the front. I turned the loco over and found that there was a screw in the chimney. Removing that screw did indeed allow me to remove the body, lifting it at the front and then sliding it forward to disengage the tong at the back. Well, I, I say that removing the chimney screw allowed me to remove the body. It didn't entirely do so at first, as there was a wire passing through the opening at the back of the cab to the tender, and this prevented the body from being totally detached and put aside, which I at first thought was really inconvenient, but it turned out that the wire wasn't permanently fixed to the tender. It was just plugged in with a bent bronze contact on the end of the wire fitting into a square hole in the front of the tender. Here you can see that wire unplugged. With the wire unplugged, I could thread it off the body and put the body aside. And I then reconnected the wire to the tender for testing, as seen here. Here's a clearer picture of the plunger pickups on the tender. Note also that the centre wheels of the tender have no flanges to allow it to get round tight curves. The centre driving wheels of the loco also have no flanges. I was a little mystified about what was going on with my testing. When I applied power directly to the brushes, the motor turned OK, which was a great relief. So now I knew that the motor itself wasn't dead. But I didn't know why I was having trouble getting the model to run. Honestly, I still don't really know. Looking at the motor at first, I thought that the wire from the tender, the black wire coming in at bottom right, was connected to the unprotected brush spring wire which didn't make a lot of sense, but actually it isn't. The black wire actually goes through a tube underneath that soldered plated wire, and then the black wire goes round the back of the motor as seen here, then it's connected to one end of something, perhaps a resistor, inside a black sleeve at left, and the other end of that component is connected to the green wire, which then goes to the metal sleeve connecting to the near side brush and there's an insulating sleeve protecting the brush spring underneath those connections. There's also a capacitor connected from the sleeve to the spring and so to the chassis. That capacitor would be for radio frequency suppression, but I don't know what the component inside the black sleeve at left is doing. The whole thing looks a bit weird and bodged, but it does actually work. I worked back from the brushes, applying power to the green wire and to the chassis, and that worked the motor fine. Then I tried the chassis and the end of the wire going to the tender, and that worked fine. Eventually, I got back to testing power to the plunger pickups on the tender and to the loco wheels, and that worked. Why it didn't work when I first tried it, I still don't know. Maybe the wire wasn't making a good contact where it was plugged into the tender. Maybe the motor was a bit seized up with old lubricant. I really don't know. I did clean and lubricate things whilst I had the loco on the bench. I cleaned the commutator, lubricated the motor, lubricated the drive gear and worm gear, lubricated the axles and motion, and cleaned the wheels and plunger pickups. Eventually, I had the loco running quite well on the bench. I was doing a bunch of track work on my three-rail tabletop when this set arrived. See my last couple of videos. When I reached a reasonable point with my track work, I turned to testing the 8F on the track. Here it is, railed up and ready to go for its initial track test. Unfortunately, at this point, I ran into another problem, which is rather going to dog the rest of this video. When I took this picture of the Loco, my good Sony still camera sort of exploded. <laughs> That's why this picture is so bright. There was a loud pop, a super bright flash, and a nasty burning smell. It seems that the flash unit in the camera burnt out. This was rather a blow, as I had been depending on that camera for good quality still photographs for quite some time. It was a Sony Cybershot DSC HS60V. I was lucky enough to pick it up used locally for 125 Canadian, and it did an excellent job for the kind of clear, detailed pictures of small subjects needed for this channel. It was also easy to use, and I could get good pictures with it fast, so I could take pictures whilst working on things without too much interference with the work. 
but sadly, most of those pictures required the use of flash. The camera will still take pictures, but with a flash unit burnt out, it isn't going to work well for what I need for the channel. So for the rest of this video, I'm afraid I'm going to be struggling to get the pictures that I want, and camera issues themselves are going to become part of the video's subject. But at this point, let's see some running video of the Loco and the rolling stock from the set as they originally came to me, apart from the servicing work that I'd done to the Loco. Well, what I wanted to do now was demonstrate the... 8F from the heavy freight set running, but also I'm afraid as I'm preparing to do this I'm sad to report that it appears that the flash on my Sony camera, what is this camera, let's see, I don't know, I forget which one this is, I don't know, I can't read the blood or anything now, it's a Sony Handycam. Well, I can't get that to focus either. Uh, I don't know. I can't find the model number. Maybe it's on the bottom there. Yes, probably. Yes. DSC HS60V, I think, yes. Well, it's been a very nice camera. I bought it second hand. And it's been a very good camera, but I'm afraid it's kind of dead now. It made a, a nasty um, sort of crack and an electronic burning smell. And now I don't think the flash is an option. It's still, I think you can still take photographs with it without the flash, but I don't think the flash is an option anymore. Oh well, back to what we're supposed to be doing. The train, the locomotive. Let me see if I can turn up the power for this. It has, of course, been on the bench having some work done on it. It's an interesting uh, exercise. I mean, they really work better when they warm up a bit, these. See, that's not bad now. But when I first ran it today, I had to give it nearly and uh, pretty much completely full power to get it going on the duet. But now it's had a bit of time to warm up a little bit. It's going. Uh, about the same as the 264 tank. It still needs about 75% power to go at any sort of anything like a decent speed, but One thing I don't see those weird pickups causing any particular problems at the moment Going over the points, you know, it has well, weird pickups. It picks up from the third rail from the entirely from the tender and from the outer rails entirely from the loco, so it's got rather a sort of separation of its pickup. It is maybe going slightly slow here, but not too bad. And that's only about 75% power, as I say. I could turn the power up now. It seems to be slowing down again now, actually, doesn't it? I don't know. Let's give it a hair more power. That's still not full. Maybe 5% more power. Shall we try and see if it can pull its train? Perhaps we will. Try and see if it can pull the freight train that came with the set. It's going to end up being rebanched as an LMS loco, but okay. But okay. We'll turn the power off there. I'm, uh, I've coupled up all the wagons that came to me in the set. I think they're probably the wagons that came with the set, though I don't know that 100%. Um, I'm a bit surprised to find these are mostly metal wagons, because I thought this was a fairly late set, although the brake van is definitely plastic. Not too sure, actually, about that white one. Uh, I thought it was plastic, but it might not be. The well, the well troll is definitely metal. And the two tanks are definitely metal, but then again, I think they kept tanks metal right to the end. And that's a great Western rate van, which in the long run I won't be using, I don't imagine. It's got metal couplings, but uh, but it's a uh, plastic van. I, I mean, I just probably won't be using it because I don't really do great Western. But... So, 
They do have a fair bit of resistance. I tried running them backwards and forwards before I coupled them to the engine. I actually had to use my pliers to adjust the coupling on the tender a bit because it was, I think it had been dropped and it was bent in to a point where it wouldn't couple. But anyway, the thing about those metal coupling is they can be quite easily adjusted. Um, the wagons here need a fair bit of pulling. I mean, there's nothing really wrong with their wheels, but, you know, they're just kind of heavy and whatever. So let's see if the engine is, in fact, capable of pulling them. I've got to bend down to reach the control. Oh, well, good sign. He's starting off about the same power he was before, about 75% power. I think we'd better, be better go up to 80% or so, maybe even 85 for this. But yes, he's pulling the train. And possibly even speeding up a little bit as he goes now. Uh, I don't anticipate running this set like this very much. As I say, I'm, I want to I want to rebadge him as an LMS engine and, and I will be I've got this one LMS brake van already and I've got a couple of LMS other LMS brake vans coming. So I'll be passing these Great Western brake vans on to somebody else and uh, concentrating on the LMS brake vans myself, but uh, let's see if we can look at the train a bit more just as it comes past us there. Quite impressive little train, eh? Oops, if I can follow it. It didn't look in focus to me, but I don't know whether that was the camera or my eyes going out of focus. <sighs> Turn the power down. Turning the power down. He glides to a stop quite gradually when you turn the power down. He doesn't stop, like, very abruptly. So that's a good sign on the whole. Um, so we'll see... I mean, I think I'm going to think about rebadging him to LMS next. Now back to the bench and back to camera issues. This picture, for example, was taken with the Sony HX60V without flash. It isn't too bad as the model was under strong light on the bench at the time. I'd taken the Loco model back to the bench with the intention of proceeding to rebadge it as LMS. The first step, of course, would be to remove or to cover the British Railways markings seen here. This is the same subject taken with the HX60V, but with the subject in shadow, it doesn't really work, although it would have been fine when the flash was working. This is the same subject shot with my Panasonic Lumix TS30 with auto flash. The Lumix TS30 is not a terrible camera, but it's certainly not in the same class as the Sony HX60V. To be fair, the Lumix TS30 retails for around 230 Canadian, whereas the HX60V was more in the $500 range, so clearly a higher-end camera. But boy, does it show in the results. I guess this picture doesn't look too bad. But when I'm used to the results that the HX60V was producing, this seems poor to me. Here's a close-up of the tender, again with the Lumix. Again, not too bad, but the flash level and sensitivity haven't been adjusted well for the macro picture, so the flash seems overbright, and the detail just isn't as sharp as in the pictures taken with the Sony HX60V, probably due to lens quality issues. I tried to take a close-up of the BR Crest with the Lumix TS30, but I just couldn't get it to focus properly. And it isn't easy to tell if it's focused well as its screen isn't all that great. Although I did sometimes make errors at focusing even with the HS60V. This is the cab side marking taken with the HS60V. And I didn't get this properly in focus. Although again I might have done better if the flash had been working. Here's the same marking shot with the Lumix TS30 and probably even worse. And this is the Sony again, quite clear but dark, with no flash. As I say, I wanted to remove these BR markings, if possible. 
I tried Microset first, as that will do a good job of removing decals if they're not covered with an overcoat, but I rather think the markings in this case weren't actually decals at all. Certainly the Microset seemed to have no effect on them. These pictures, by the way, were taken with the Lumix. Next, I tried some methyl hydrate. I have a big jug of this, and I can't even remember why I bought it. But I've tried it before for removing markings on railway models with some success. And again here, it seemed to work quite well, removing the crest markings without taking off the black underneath. Although, obviously, this is bound to be somewhat a matter of luck, and the methyl hydrate might well remove all of the paint entirely, just depending what kind of paint it is. After doing my best to remove all of the crest paint with the methyl hydrate on cotton buds, I washed the side of the tender with water. The markings seemed to have been pretty well removed. I was initially thinking of just removing the four digits on the sides of the cab and leaving the rest of the numbers in place, as this would have been fairly appropriate. But the paint for the numbers came off quite readily with the methyl hydrate, and I ended up removing some of the other numbers without trying. So I pretty much had to remove the running number entirely. I did manage to leave the 8F marking, however. I did the same things on the other side. There does seem to be quite a bit of yellow paint left here, but that was mostly loose and washed off with water. Here's the left side after my removal efforts. This picture is with the Sony again, with strong light, no flash. I was a bit in two minds as to whether I should try to apply some black paint. That might have helped to hide the marks left over by the removal of the BR markings. But those marks were nowhere near as obvious in regular light as they are here, and I was afraid that trying to apply black paint might just make things worse. So I decided to try applying new markings without using any black paint. I figured that if the results were really bad, I would still have the option of removing my new decals and resorting to some black paint. For the decaling, I got out this HMRS Pressfix set of crew, straw, loco and coach block style markings. I figured that these should be the most appropriate for the 8F. I applied LMS letters to the tender, placing them based on pictures of real locos that I'd checked. This is how the press fix decals are initially applied, with their backing tissue just pressed into place, hence the name. This picture and the previous one were taken with the Lumix, but on the screen of the Lumix, it appeared that the LMS letters couldn't really be seen through the backing tissue. So I tried a picture with the Lumix, but with the flash turned off. And then I tried a picture with the damaged Sony. I also used the press fix decals to apply new running numbers to the side of the cab. The spacing is a bit odd as the riveting got in the way. Also, the colour of the original 8F marking doesn't match the running number. But I would have had difficulty replacing the 8F markings. Here's the other side after remarking a flash picture with a Lumix. You can still see where the BR crest was, but it really is hardly noticeable in normal light. Here's the other side, taken with a damaged Sony. This was taken with a damaged Sony, but with flash nominally turned on. Perhaps not a good idea to even try, given that the flash unit is clearly burnt out. This produced a rather strange-looking picture. Here's a picture from the front of the loco, taken the same way. This really doesn't work, obviously. And here's the same subject, again with the damaged Sony, but with the flash specifically turned off. Clearly a better result. I was taking these pictures mainly to show the running number on the smoke box door. I removed the original BR running number that came on the model with methyl hydrate again, and then used some Model Master water slide decals to apply the new running number. Here's a close-up of the smoke box door with the Lumix with flash. And again. The decals I used were actually from a set of for Southern Railways wagons. I bought them specifically with the idea of using the numbers in the set. In this case, I managed to find numbers with 8, 0 and 2, 5 as digit combinations, so I only had to apply two decals to get the number that I wanted. 
By the way, the 8F with the LMS number 8025 was built at Crewe in 1935, one of the first batch built. It was actually the last 8F to pass into BR service, bought by British Railways in 1957. So here's the model on the bench, rebadged and ready to go back to the track. Lumix picture, not bad, but not great. I got the model onto my three-rail tabletop track to give it a run. I got my Sony Handycam HDR CX700 video camera out to shoot the video of this running. The CX700 can also take still pictures, though I've never really used it much for that purpose. Apart from anything else, its form factor as a video camera doesn't really lend itself too well to still photography. But under the circumstances, I thought I'd give it a try. This is what I got when I pressed the picture button with the camera still in video mode. I don't really quite understand what is supposed to be happening here. When I switched the camera to picture mode by pressing the mode button and then pressed the picture button, this was the result that I got. Quite different. Apart from anything else, the camera does have a flash inside its lens hood and the flash fired in this case. The result is not too bad, though the flash is probably really too bright for the close subject. Here's the brake van that I put on the train, again shot with the CX700 in picture mode. Again, the result is rather washed out due to the flash being too bright for the close subject. And here's the loco on the track, back with the Lumix TS30. And the brake van with the Lumix. I took off the GWR Toad-style van that came with the set and substituted a Midland-style van with LMS markings as being more appropriate with what I was now running as an LMS train. And here's that train ready to go, still with the Lumix camera. And finally, from the front. So now I'll finish with running video with the new LMS markings, shot with the Handycam CX700, and I'm really keeping my fingers crossed that that continues to work okay. Well, I have rebadged as best as I can this 8F as an LMS loco, <laughs> while struggling mightily with camera problems, because... The flash on my Sony, my Sony camera I'm used to using doesn't work anymore. And the Panasonic Lumix, it's not a horrible camera, but it's not as good as the Sony, and I'm struggling to get the kind of pictures I want with it. Anyway, we've got the same train. There were a couple more wagons that came with this set, but I think they were extra to the original set anyway. Um, and, but I've changed the brake van out now since it's an LMS engine. I've put an LMS brake van on which is a Horn B1 that came to me as plain grey that I put the LMS letters on. Okay, so let's see if we can just run the train again as an LMS train. Famous last words. Now I've got to... Ooh, see how I... Oh, there's clocks chiming all over the place. That enough power? Not quite, I don't think. Not really, not to get smooth running. <sighs> Sorry, I'm not my camera works not very good. Well, I've been having rather a struggle this morning all round, you know, with this what was a flash on my good still camera exploding on me. And, Whether you can see the number on the front of the loco there. I use water slide decals for that. Oh, when we it's, oh, it's noon. <laughs> so you've got maximum clock timing. Lots and lots of clock timing. I generally try and avoid clock timing on my videos, but the heck with it. I think we'll just have to put up with it now. So there you are. I sort of Metamorphose Heavy Freight Set. One more, one more squat maybe, then I'll, then I'm going to try and power it down. Ooh, ow. No, oh, I powered it up rather than down. There you go. Ooh, dear. 